The Pirate Bay is a name that once sent shivers down the spines of media giants. It was more than just a website, but a digital battleground. Founded by a group of misfits and outcasts, the Pirate Bay was the flag bearer of a controversial mission. Their motivation wasn't the pursuit of riches or corporate sabotage, but it was an ideology. They believed that information, culture, and knowledge should be shared freely, unrestrained by corporate greed, Incredible bureaucracy, corporate or greed. political interference. So, with all the resources and power of the FBI, why did it struggle to shut down the Pirate Bay? The Pirate Bay was the brainchild of three exceptional individuals, Frederick Nage, Gottfried Svartholm, and Peter Sunda. These three didn't follow the traditional paths of success. Frederick Nage, the eldest of the trio, was born in 1978 in Jönköping, Sweden. He was rumored to have dropped out of high school, leading a rather unpredictable life. Gottfried Svartholm, born in 1984, was a classic computer nerd of the late 90s and early 2000s. He had a skill for hacking, much like the character Dennis Nidri from Jurassic Park. Then there was Peter Sunda, born in 1978, who initially had a relatively normal upbringing. His parents' divorce when he was eight led to a series of relocations, and he dropped out of school in his teens. Yet, computers became his refuge from a chaotic reality, and he emerged as a skilled programmer. But what united them was their early involvement in anti-copyright movements. Frederick had been fighting for the freedom of information long before the birth of the Pirate Bay. He was part of a Swedish anti-copyright group, engaging in piracy debates and promoting the right to information. Their collaboration began with the founding of the Pirate Bay, an audacious project rooted in ideology rather than profit. The idea was simple, but deep. Information, culture, and knowledge should be shared freely worldwide liberated from corporate greed, bureaucracy, and political influence. So, how did this unconventional trio turn their ideals into one of the most notorious and influential websites in the world? The popularity of the Pirate Bay skyrocketed, making it a household name among those seeking free downloads. Hollywood and the entertainment industry were quick to react. They saw this platform as a direct threat to their revenue streams. As early as 2006, Hollywood claimed that piracy, facilitated mainly by the Pirate Bay, had cost them a staggering $6.1 billion in a single year. In their quest to shut down the platform, Hollywood embarked on a legal battle, seeking the intervention of authorities. However, their initial attempts to dismantle the Pirate Bay proved futile. Sweden, the home country of the platform's founders, was surprisingly relaxed about copyright and patents, with a political party called the Pirate Party actively advocating for copyright reform. Hollywood's cries for action were met with a calm response. Despite Hollywood's lobbying efforts and demands for intervention, the Pirate Bay stood its ground. The site's resilience stemmed from its unique infrastructure. Unlike traditional websites, it didn't host files or engage in direct downloads. Instead, it acted as a massive index of links, while the actual downloading occurred through peer-to-peer -peer connections. This made it incredibly challenging to bring the site down as its small, easily replicated structure could be quickly reinstated even after takedowns. So, how did Hollywood respond to the unwavering persistence of the Pirate Bay? Hollywood was determined to end the Pirate Bay, and they explored multiple avenues to combat the platform. They engaged in extensive lobbying and sought support from major tech companies in their mission to suppress the Pirate Bay. Collaborations with industry giants like Google, Facebook, Microsoft, and internet service providers were intended to restrict the sharing and searching of Pirate Bay links. But this move had unintended consequences. It only intensified the platform's popularity. The Pirate Bay's rise in popularity continued, and it soon became the 97th most visited website by 2008. It seemed that every effort to suppress it only drew more attention and users to the platform. Now, let's talk about the legal battles and charges brought against the Pirate Bay's founders. The Pirate Bay was also embroiled in a series of legal battles as authorities sought to hold its founders accountable. The legal charges brought against Frederick Nage, Gottfried Svartholm, Peter Sunda, and one of their key supporters, Carl Lundstrom were centered on copyright infringement and aiding piracy. The initial verdicts and sentences were far from lenient. In April 2009, all four were found guilty. The court handed down prison sentences ranging from one year to 10 months, along with a collective fine of 30 million kroner, or approximately $3.5 million. The Pirate Bay's legal team argued that the platform merely hosted links 
and did not actively encourage piracy, but this argument did not hold up in court. The founders then made appeals to reduce their sentences. While they succeeded in shortening their prison terms, the fines were increased to 46 million kroner, or about $6.5 million. Now, what did they do after serving prison, and how did they respond to the legal repercussions? After serving their prison sentences, the founders of the Pirate Bay pursued various endeavors that continued to capture attention. For instance, Frederick Nage created Bayfiles, another file-sharing platform, in 2011. While Bayfiles claimed to comply with copyright rules, its legacy was closely tied to the world of file-sharing. Gottfried Svartholm, on the other hand, took an intriguing turn. He became actively involved with WikiLeaks, the international organization known for publishing classified and sensitive information. His role extended to infiltrating Denmark's social security and driver's license databases. This involvement furthered his reputation in hacking and digital activism. Meanwhile, Peter Sunda ventured into politics. He joined Finland's Pirate Party and even ran for the European Parliament in the 2014 election. His commitment to advocating for digital rights and copyright reform was evident. However, his political involvement was not without consequences, as he faced arrest shortly after the election, resulting in a five-month prison term. Now, the Pirate Bay's legacy continues to shape the digital landscape. Despite legal actions and repeated attempts to bring it down, the platform's spirit lives on. One of the key reasons for this enduring legacy is the proliferation of mirror sites. These mirror sites are replicas of the original Pirate Bay, providing access to its extensive collection of torrents. Even when authorities have managed to shut down the main site, mirror sites have swiftly emerged, making it incredibly challenging to eradicate the Pirate Bay entirely. The difficulty in shutting down the platform for good stems from its unique infrastructure. Again, the Pirate Bay doesn't host files, but acts as an index of links with downloading occurring through peer-to-peer -peer connections. This minimalistic structure allows for quick revival after takedowns. Furthermore, as authorities continue to combat the Pirate Bay, alternative platforms and torrent sites have stepped in to fill the void. These alternatives provide users the same access to a wide array of content further complicating any attempts to suppress online piracy. But some people might wonder about the moral and ethical implications of piracy. Is it right to download and share copyrighted content without permission? While some argue that piracy is a way to access information and culture freely, others believe it infringes on the rights and livelihood of creators and the entertainment industry. So, where do you stand on the issue of piracy? Is it a matter of personal choice? Or should there be stricter regulations in place to protect copyright? Share your thoughts in the comments below, and don't forget to subscribe for more captivating business insights.